All right, we're recording. All right, um, Tom, I'll let you do the typical intro stuff. You've got that, I'm sure, in the back of your head by now with all these meetings going sure. on. Sure. Uh, call the uh, subcommittee for compliance and enforcement to order. Just take a quick roll based on what I see here on the screen. Looks like Mark Gorman present. Present. Ingrid Jonas present. Present. Tim Wessel present. Here. Perry. Sorry, you're muted. I I know I always butcher your last name. <laughs> Daguerre is present as well. Um, here, here, here. <laughs> David Huber is also on the call. President. Frank Cranwinkle. Megan Hopkins. I think Ashley like, is joining us too. Yeah. All right. Ashley, can you hear us? Yep. Present hey, well. Guys. And then Kyle, do you just want to? Tell us who's in the room with you. Sure, Kyle Harris, member, Cannabis Control Board. We have uh, Nellie Marvel, our Admin Services Coordinator, Bryn Hare, our Executive Director, Lindsay Wells, the Medical Marijuana Program Administrator, Julie Holbert, Cannabis Control Board members in the room, David Chair, General Counsel, Cannabis Control Board, and then we have two members of the public, three members of the public. you're muted Tom. sorry thank you Kyle did you want to uh, move forward with the agenda Kyle or do you want me to yeah I think I think uh, moving forward with the agenda I think today what we're hopeful you know Tom and, and Mark and um, NACB have have done some research on local ordinances looking at other um, other states that have um, an adult use program that also happened to be Dillon states and it doesn't look like there's many there's many of them but I thought I'd, um, you know Tom if you and Mark could could give an overview of that we do have a couple model ordinances um, that could serve the starting point but but Tom was kind enough to remind me today that, that some of those local ordinances were you know um, developed through um, I don't know did they were they through statute Tom I know that they're they're different than um, they're not, they're a little bit less restrictive than we would anticipate some of this this being in the state um, of Vermont. But I'd love to get your um, your perspective on your research, and then we can share some of that information to the to the subcommittee and, and put it up on our website after this is over. I br I briefly want to talk about seed to sale tracking and kind of um, the board's uh, thoughts on how we can move. Um, that forward, recognizing we're probably going to have to put out a request for proposals or for services um, sooner rather than later to make sure that this can start to line up with what we're hoping to launch. Um, I know that Tim and Ingrid were unable to join us last week for various reasons, so happy that you're back here with us um, today. We got a great conversation from David and Carrie on their capabilities from um, an enforcement and compliance perspective on outdoor cultivation and indoor cultivation. I was hoping Carrie and Dave could just give the very five minute um, level overview of that. We'll have recordings of those previous meetings for you, Tim and Ingrid, hopefully in the coming days. Um, unless, you know, from what you hear now and you feel comfortable on voting something like this later today, we can have that conversation um, towards the end of the hour. If not, I'd love to put up um, the agency of Ag working with the Agency of Agriculture for a vote um, Thursday. So just let us know how comfortable you are, no pressure at all. I just wanna start moving moving forward and then if we have time um, would love to discuss subcommittee priorities but I think we also might uh, be waiting to do that on on Thursday so let's see how far we get and and hopefully tee up some votes either later today or, or on Thursday sounds good do you, uh, Kyle do you want me to discuss uh, what, what Mark and I found regarding the local ordinances. Yeah, if you could give us that um, that overview. Um, sure. That would be great. Yeah, and, and um, I mean, start at the most basic level. Uh, a lot of states do follow the D Dillon rule, but but they're mixed states. So um, just to start off with the research, I mean, Nevada and, and Virginia are two states that, that are purely uh, Dillon rule states. So that's what we, we look to uh, this weekend 
I provided Kyle with model local ordinances from um, from Nevada, specifically Reno uh, and Las Vegas, and that's what are the most available. Virginia is relatively new, um, so we're, we're not having success. I, I don't know how many towns and municipalities have adopted uh, their own local ordinances. Um, so that that's what we were able to provide. But as Kyle said, and if you take a look at the reference materials that we disseminated before the first subcommittee meeting, uh, Act 164, and, and Stephanie Smith referenced this in our first subcommittee meeting, but th there's not a lot left to um, the, the towns and municipalities as far as um, as far as other powers that that the legislation grants and certainly there there still are you know substantial factors within the towns and municipalities such as zoning uh and such as fees but as far as creating any other uh bylaws under the enabling statutes that just doesn't exist uh in vermont right now that's not the case in other states like nevada so my caveat to to Kyle was, uh, you know, you can take a look at these as, as models as a Dillon state, but just keep in mind that um, Nevada statute uh, is is vastly different from Vermont with respect to uh, how much powers the, the, the states and, and localities have. Uh, what we also provided, um, Mark was able to find uh, from states like Connecticut and Virginia, some of the recommendations that their own cannabis boards uh, were able to send to their legislators. Uh, and I think that that'll be instructive as well. So, um, I mean, it might be helpful to, to discuss that in greater depth. If there's questions, Kyle, maybe on Thursday's meeting after, after everyone's had a chance to take a look at that. Yeah, I just did forward it to all the members of the subcommittee. Um, okay. I know that that's, and you know that you got right now and it's hard to discuss it in real time um tim i want to give you an opportunity to talk given your your role um on the subcommittee um as it relates to anything tom just to gave us but i mean i, I totally understand how you haven't had a, an opportunity to really sink into this material uh well thank you but um i yeah it's true it just dropped into my email e box uh, email box um, and that was simply the um, which states are Dillon's and which states are home rule when it comes to um, yeah it looks like there's some there's tables. active hyperlinks on that uh, word doc that kind of pull you okay um, and then there's some you know I think the Connecticut and in Virginia or especially the Connecticut um, PDF was was helpful and instructive for me I, I think what might be helpful for us to talk about um, in broad strokes is if, you know, is the subcommittee planning on developing a model ordinance for the board to help use to distribute out to municipalities in and around Vermont? Is that something, Tim, that you think, you know, would be a good use of this subcommittee's time and, and the board's time in helping develop that at this point in the game? Can you repeat that? Um, as exactly. We, as we look at suggestions for municipal ordinances, helping municipalities understand what power they will have over retail establishments um, in their respective municipalities. How can this subcommittee be helpful in communicating this as a starting point, this language that the board will then, you know, look at and then hopefully we can distribute through the League of Cities and Towns and other partners, um, obviously get their input as well. I think Joel is doing some roundtable discussions with municipalities later this week. Yes. Um, but, but how can this, you know, I'm trying to break the ice on um, model ordinances, fees are a different part of the conversation, but wrapped up into it, I, I get that. But but how can we, use, utilizing this subcommittee, really make some type of progress on giving guidance to um, those that are interested in this being a part of their community? Um, well, I mean, I, I just would try not to be flippant, but any guidance whatsoever would probably be welcomed by municipalities um, yeah. in Vermont who are honestly not used to getting any advanced uh, input taken at all. With, um, Fair enough. We were 
you know, municipalities in Vermont are used to just being hoping that uh, the state will be uh, keeping them in mind and their duties and their challenges in mind when they go forward. So um, I would say that uh, any and all uh, guidance taken from municipalities would be would be welcome. And certainly, I think Julie was already um, talking to me about possibly uh, delaying a roundtable, which at this point sounds wise um, until next week. And then because we're not really sure of all of the uh, what's coming out of of this committee. So, yeah, totally. That makes sense. I didn't want to put Julie on the spot who's sitting in the room. I know it was scheduled yeah. for tomorrow, but um, I know that that has also been discussed and delaying that just so we can all have a better understanding of what's coming out of this committee and, and survey results. Julie, I don't want to put you on the on the spot, but do you have any suggestions for how, and how this committee can be useful in, in, in front of that round table or before that round table? Um, I think if you discuss the model ordinances and if there are some things that we can, if there are specific questions that we can ask of the round table, that's probably the best way to get their feedback. You know, given that it's a, a group that's very probably from large towns to small towns, you know, if we have specific questions that we can ask them, I think that's probably the best way to frame that round table. So if there are questions that this group has, you know, those are things I could take to that round table. That's great. So I think, you know, um, what I would propose to the subcommittee members is I just forwarded you um, the email that Tom and Mark had sent Brent and I this morning. Um, take some time if you have the ability to do so over the course of the next couple of days. I'd love to discuss those model ordinances in a little bit more detail on Thursday. I mean, that agenda is going to fill up quickly, but that's the nature of what's going on here. And we can really look to, um, to think about how we can best be helpful ahead of your roundtable the following week. Yeah, that would be great. Does that sound like a good... Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, if I, if I could just ask Tim a question so I have a better sense of what, what we're dealing with. Um, and, and Tim, you and I can have this discussion offline as well, but what, where, where the rubber hits the road on a lot of this as far as municipalities or, or localities, and this just is, it's not just in Vermont, but um, it's with the local zoning boards. And that's what, if, if you're awarded a license, that's the next big step that, that you've got to take depending where you're located. So I'm just trying to get a sense, um, it, it'll help us um, decide how these model or local ordinances can be shaped. Uh, like does, does your town or does your municipality or, or in general, do they all have um, established zoning boards with with those type of, of regulations developed on a, on a town level? Um, or, and I know it's gonna vary depending on the size of of the town or, or, the, or the locality, um, but I'm just trying to figure out the level of um, the level of established kind of boards that we have across the state. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, I mean, I can, without going back and doing a little bit of research, as maybe we all should be doing at this point, but. Uh, I can only speak for Brattleboro the way we're structured. We definitely have both staff capacity and um, board capacity separate, clearly from select board. Um, but, uh, you know, it's zoning rules have to be run through the state as well because of the Dillon's rule uh, situation. Uh, so I, there's no one answer to that. There's a range, but I guess I can try to help to. Uh, to get a fuller picture of that. Um, and again, I was kind of hoping to to glean some of that from the roundtable responses that uh, Julie was good enough to put together that survey. And, sure. Uh, uh, because I, I, I only have experience with Brattleboro at this point. I'm not really a consultant sure. for the rest of Vermont municipalities. So. Yeah, so if, if I were if I were going to put up a, a McDonald's or that was going to go up in Brattleboro, um, mm -hmm. that at some point McDonald's or whoever w was putting up an establishment would have to submit um, and get the license from an established zoning board in Brattleboro. Is that? Yeah, 
in our okay. case, it's a de developmental review board. Um, first, it would go through, it would be screened and sort of uh, requirements would be checked off through a planning department. Um, so that's pretty universal to have a planning department and a, and a um, developmental review board. Um, but I've never actually served on the DRB in here in Brattleboro, but uh, I'm, I'm familiar enough with the process. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Tim um, and Tom. Is, is just reviewing this information and, and coming back and trying to uh, put some, um, you know, some thought into how we can best help the roundtable serve as a good way to approach this at the next meeting. I think that I could be wrong, but I also think local fees will be discussed either today or on Thursday in the market structure committee, which which also might help inform some of that part of this conversation. Okay. So last Thursday, I want to move on, uh, Tom, to just a continuation of this of the seed to sale um, conversation. Um, for those that weren't with us last Thursday, um, we heard from the hemp team at the Agency of Agriculture and the vendor that they're using to help um, with licensing and and hopefully using seed to sale tracking um, through that that vendor called um, Hemp Trace. I think that's right, Carrie Trace, Vermont. I, don't, I can't exactly remember off the top of my head. I think what would be helpful is I want to I want to give the the subcommittee an opportunity to talk with Lindsay Wells, who runs our medical marijuana um, program here, and she has some institutional knowledge that she'll be bringing um, from that program from a software perspective and working with a couple different companies. So I wanted to give. Lindsay, an opportunity to share what she thinks from a functionality perspective and a non-functionality perspective would be prudent for the subcommittee and the board to consider if we're going to move towards a, a seed to sale tracking um, vendor relationship over the course of the next couple months. So some things are to consider um, what you would be tracking um, certain data elements for each step along the proce process and how that information gets pushed along um, and um, what kind of requirements for the system would be needed as far as like security users, um, you know, there'd be different types of user accounts for everybody logging into the system. Um, and is this a system that the board would also be utilizing? That'd be a functional requirement. It could be um, communications could be passed through here if it was uh, documents such as records that could be shared. Um, and then reports that could be run by the licensee or by the board those types of like high level functional requirements um, does it you know I don't know, in my world like HIPAA compliant or any kind of like other type of security needs that may be met needed to be met because there may be um, financial data that could be if it's connecting to the the NIC or the VIC, the payment, the state payment processor, the National Information Consortium, there's certain security requirements that'll have to be met there. So all those kinds of pieces will need to be housed in the RFP when it goes out to proposal that you're going to be looking for a vendor to meet these requirements. So, so Lindsay, I have a quick question and we can see if anybody on the phone uh, or on the Teams link has a has a question. So it's my understanding that, that and I'm not a software guy, so excuse my rudimentary understanding of, of how this works, at least in your world. So, so you allow each dispensary to choose their own platform as long as it syncs up with your platform. Is that correct? Yeah, so our solution can integrate with anything that pretty much that, even if it doesn't have an open API, but that's the easiest way to integrate as long as it has an open API. And we can push or pull information. With all the like suspected users from a small cultivator all the way up, does that model 
seem would would that type of model make sense, or would would you think it would be better for everybody to be using the same model it, from a seed to sale tracking platform? So it has its good and its bad, which is something that would have to be weighed out. Um, I think the good would be that the licensees would have a product once it was implemented that had all of the requirements laid out in there for them, but also it's nice if they can go pick something that they would like and they can integrate in. Um, it could take some time okay. for that to integrate though. Carrie, I see your hands up. I was actually gonna pull from some of yeah, your expertise I, before I even saw the hands, so I'm glad it's up. No, I, I was just wondering, I think I missed it if Lindsay mentioned what what the name of the platform that they're using is. The platform we have is called Visual Vault. And okay. it's not a it it's not a cannabis system. It's not what it was initially for, but we can use it to store like all of our documents in it. Um, but the dispensaries they have their seed to sale tracking system that we we can we're integrated with, and we can pull information in, and we could push information into their system. And there's a couple of different ways we can push it in. We didn't want to just push info in there without them knowing about what it was so they were able to view it and they were able to accept it and it would push it in so those are some different options um is that something that ads supports or do you have a third party vendor a uh, third party vendor visual vault okay all right carrie i wanted to tap into some of your expertise and also Tom, feel free to, to speak up. You know, I think the way I understand, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lindsay, I mean, we have a, a handful of dispensaries in the state that are using their own seed to sale tracking platform that integrates with what we have as a state, right? Is that a system that's gonna work with a couple hundred people at very, or license holders? And a couple hundred is just a, a, a broad number I'm pulling out of my head. Um, from, from small cultivators all the way up and down the supply chain, or is it better to go with one pro or one vendor that the cannabis control board would say, this is who, this is, this is the direction that we're going? Does that make sense? Yeah, are you asking me or Lindsay? I think it's better to go with something that works. So whatever's tried and true, right? Um, if Lindsay's got a vendor that's off the shelf and it integrates, with a whole bunch of different platforms, it uh, might make sense to go that way. I think it's worth um, getting demonstrations from from both Visual Vault and the folks at Trace just to see what they're offering. In the end, you're going to need something that works, and we can only guess until we actually get a demonstration. I know that there's yep. other uh, other big. Um, you know, platform providers that, that are present in other states. I guess I was trying to see if, if, if we're gonna put something out. And I know that yep. a lot of those dispensaries use utilize some of those platforms like Metric or MJ Freeway or... MJ Freeway, LeafLogic, BioTrack, THC, 365 Cannabis. Cool. I if guess all I'm, of those, I'm thinking about small cultivators and, and just how much legwork it's gonna be on their end to, to form that relationship and do that analysis before they d decide whether or not it will integrate into our system. I'm not a software guy, so I could be butchering a part of this conversation, but I'm just trying to, to figure out, is it better to go with one or a, a system that integrates with whoever they decide to work with? Well, they all offer the different levels of tracking and tracing. And the, uh, the first couple were designed to sort of integrate with the coal memo which wanted each individual plant, each individual seed tracked. Um, or, you know, we have, we're having the conversations about, are we tracking lots or are we tracking individual plants? And I think that decision needs to be made before you sort of head in one software direction or the other. 
I agree, and I, I'm 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 getting there. I'm I'm try. So so what I think will be the best way for us to to handle this part of the priority list from seed to sale tracking perspective is what I'm hope I'm hoping that the subcommittee can um, help us determine what is most appropriate to include in an RFP. So if small cultivators are benefited by going with lot a lot number instead of having to, to track and trace each sp specific plant, that's something that I would love to hear. You know, Lindsay kind of said how seed to sale tracking information can be helpful. Um, I think from both sides of the, the coin, inventory management, um, cultivation metrics, banking needs, it's data for us in real time uh, from a compliance and enforcement perspective. I think I'm. I think at this point, I'm most interested to to hear and carry tapping into your expertise how we can craft something um, to put out for an RFP that would help small cultivators. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful to take away some thoughts from this conversation and turn it into a charge or a paragraph that the subcommittee might feel comfortable voting on that would form the basis of an RFP that we would put out to look for a relationship with a vendor that really crystallizes how this technology should be used from a functionality perspective and the non-functionality perspective in the state. So from like a broader compliance and enforcement standpoint to um, a system that's not just for seed to sale tracking, it, it provides that in licensing. one way or the other, but there's licensing. I don't know if there's been any discussion about, like we have incident reporting, so if there's a violation of the rules, they have an opportunity to inform us of the violation and let us know what corrective actions have been taken, have taken place and we take it from there. So those are all housed in there and the licensees able to go in and submit those to us and they all attach to their record along with the individuals who work for them and they can process their renewal in there, um, whatever part they may because fingerprinting obviously would not occur through our system. But they could do everything and then once the results, you're able to issue their card. I'm, I guess I'm making an assumption about issuing a card and then from our system we can print that out so it's like a broader compliance and enforcement piece there's some other um, functions that we have in our system thank you Lindsay Tom thanks I just had a couple questions for Lindsay while, while we have her here I, I mean first when when you were talking about lot or individual plans Lindsay how do you track it currently in in medical they have to track every plant that's what I thought okay and then I mean I, I've got kind of the same questions that I had for, for great at the last meeting a lot of what is being experienced in, in other states as far as problems with the software um, the slowdown seemed to be from from updates uh, or just slow communications with, with troubleshooting. Have you experienced any of that with, with visual or had any problems? Well, they have their regular um, updates. Um, I'm notified ahead of time if there will be any downtime. Um, I have ample notice to post something up on our website if it's going to have any impact to the portal. I don't think that it's been over like a 30 minute interruption potentially to people using the portal um, but we do get those messages um, you know they do regularly update it to keep up with whatever the latest and greatest security stuff is but but it hasn't it hasn't really slowed you down from a functionality perspective it's not it hasn't been too cumbersome or, or slow problematic no it's a, it, so and some of the changes like I can make to the system myself so it's it's very user friendly from um, you know program perspective um, there are some things that I need to ask the vendor to do but it as part of our contract it lays out how long they have to respond 
but they've been so responsive to be honest, like, I, I haven't had to familiarize myself with that section of the contract because they're norm normally they get back to us shortly after we email and I would say, you know, within an hour or two if there's any issues. Good. And there haven't been any data breaches? No. Okay. Thank you. Tom, a question for you, just in, in your experience working in, a, in with other jurisdictions using this type of technology, do other jurisdictions allow a license holder to go form a relationship with their own software company that integrates with what the state is using, or is it, you know, a license holder needs to go register with X company in order um, to work from a seed to sale tracking perspective within the, the, the state guidelines and regulations? Well, and, and this is my understanding, and I, I think this is what Lindsay was describing. Each license holder can use whatever software that they want to use. Um, that the API is what's critical when, when Lindsay was saying the, the open API and how that interacts with whatever software program that the state is using. And that's that's the critical connection is how those how well those two mesh together and how, how those are tracked. Okay. Um, so no matter where you are in the state, each each license holder can use whatever software they, they want. It's just how it interfaces with whatever the, the state is using on, on their system. Okay. That's, to follow up on one of your questions about um, a way to make this easier on the small cultivator, I think if it's possible to go with a software where they don't have to buy anything, but they log on to a system that the state owns, I think that's one way to take a load off um, the cultivator. They essentially don't have to buy any software, so I think we should have a system that sort of the state is running that they can log on to without having to purchase any standalone software. That's kind of like a better way to ask some of my questions because I'm not a software guy. I don't, I don't know if that's how it works in other states or if it's the, the relationship that the medical program has with its, its license holders or, you know, what's, what are the bigger states doing? Yeah, uh, and, and I'll, I can just tell you here in Arizona because, you know, this, you're now going back six or seven years when it had its medical program. The state didn't have its own software program, so each of the license holders were, were using their own if, if they had it because it wasn't mandated yet. Um, and so because that was kind of legacied in, they still have their, their systems. Um, I mean, Mark, that's probably something you and I can look into, the newer jurisdictions, uh, how that's that's set up, although Vermont's a little bit unique um, sure. with the small later uh, but uh, I think in my experience for the most part license holders are getting their own software um, and not relying on the state great um, okay so so this has been this has been helpful for me hopefully it's been helpful for other subcommittee members I think what I would like to do Tom is is maybe Brent and I can take a stab at, at doing a uh, a par writing a paragraph, a charge that the, the subcommittee would consider consider um, sending to the full board as part of an RFP to um, work or put out for for work with this type of software. Um, with with these comments in mind, with the small cultivators that carry um, set in mind, this this lot versus per plant, and understanding the, re the the dynamics and how that might affect a small cultivator a little bit more than it, it would some of our larger operators but if we can get something together and, and fully on board and share it with the subcommittee on Thursday that's something um, I would like to do to make sure that it's from a, a record-keeping perspective a, a compliance perspective it, it makes sense because this could look a couple different ways depending on the functionalities that are best suited for the state sound good okay all right, so it's 2.38, um, moving along. Um, what I'd like to do is have a, a continued conversation about cultivation compliance. Tim and Ingrid, I know you weren't with us last week and we did communicate this morning. Um, Carrie and David, I'd love to, to give you an opportunity just very quickly to um, give Tim and, and Ingrid who haven't had an opportunity really to hear from your mouths on, um, 
on the capabilities that the Agency of Agriculture has, how you can help us as part of our broader consumer protection program with outdoor and indoor cultivation inspection, enforcement and compliance. Carrie, I did send you a couple questions that I know Tom had, um, and if you wouldn't mind just sure. incorporating those into your comments for the better of the group, that would be great. All right, I will, and um, I'll start with those questions, and then um, Dave, just uh, chime in or interrupt me if you've got anything to add. Uh, first, it says, how many agents does the Department of Ag have? Um, and that's sort of, <laughs> we have a bunch, but it's really dependent on, on which ones we're talking about. Um, I do have a hemp inspector, um, Mike, who oh. you, some of you know and some of you have heard from and there's um, a lab compliance officer in the program and Stephanie that manages the hemp program. I also have six field agents that could be cross trained but depending on how much of the program you would want at the agency of ag we could have a standalone cannabis quality control program um, that just added more mics to the mix. Um, while having those other six field agents cross train to do inspection. So right now, um, I would like uh, sort of, once we get closer to a decision, I can tell you how much resources we have to devote to that. And it, um, it says what, the next question was, what square footage do they cover currently? Are you, do you mean him? Like Tom, what did you mean? Sorry, yeah, um, it'd be helpful to know, yeah, how much, do you know this, roughly the square footage for, for hemp? And then I was just wondering for, so if you have, you have six hemp field agents for the rest of, of ag? Yeah, so uh, in the hemp program, um, the there was acre, we have a number of acreages, uh, a number four acreages, um, that was in the thousands of acres, so that's 42,000 square feet, or 46,000 square feet, feet per acre. Um, okay. I think it's and, also and, helpful, yeah. uh, might be helpful to also think about it in terms of license holders too, Tom, and I know, I think I think Stephanie's estimated to us that they have, what, carry about 600 license holders, and the average license holder is planning on a, a half acre or less. Right. So. And that's all just under Mike who said he was maybe it is yep but but on occasion so we do have the other six inspectors um, are trained for pesticide inspections and they go to these facilities as well um, in terms of square footage that might be a question for Lindsay because she knows square footage is of for the dispensaries but we can get there eventually and we are at about 20% of those cultivators inspected annually. So right. in five years, we would get to all of them. Right, and, and, and I remember that 20% number. I mean, how, how does that, just outside of hemp, what does that look like for the rest of the of your department for, for agriculture when you're looking at your other inspectors? Yep, so it depends. It depends on um, size. So it, your next question, existing crops requiring lab testing. So that those same inspectors do pesticide, feed, seed, and fertilizer um, inspections as well. Um, our class A dealers, class A pesticide dealers get visited up to six times a year. The class B dealers, which are um, less toxic pesticides, they get visited at least once every other year. Um, we do take feed samples, we do take fertilizer samples, they do go to the lab for compliance testing. We also take pesticide samples for investigatory complaints, uh, drift and misuse, but also we do take compliance samples as well to make sure something was formulated correctly. Um, in terms of compliance rate sort of the feed dealers we take multiple samples from each feed dealer every year so number of 
entities inspected is 100%, but we don't test 100% of the fee that they're producing. So there's a enforcement presence, um, relationship development. It helps to create a culture of compliance, but we're not there at 100%. Um, we're not sampling 100% of what they produce. Um, and I can't tell you, based on tonnage, exactly what percentage we're sampling because we don't actually record the lot size. Um, we do get tonnage for fertilizer at the end of the year. Um, I guess I could do a calculation on what percentage of the fertilizer tonnage gets sampled, but I haven't actually, I don't have that as a statistic right now. Um, the next question is what training do our inspectors receive? Um, Dave, I'm going to let you kick, hand it over to you and just go over all the trainings that you've put together for all the inspectors or how, have offered to them. Sure. I have a uh, question. What other, uh, sorry. Can I ask a question before we sort of switch over? Are there any confidentiality issues that the board should be aware of during an investigation? Carrie? In terms of what? Like, would you be, or under your rules statute, are you allowed to share information during an ongoing investigation? No. No, and we don't make compliance, we don't make enforcement actions public either. Um, once they're finalized, they're available upon, or by a, um, public records request public records request thanks dave but yeah no none of our compliance no open cases are sort of allowed for public consumption would that be an issue with the board with your folks going out you mean you mean the board being able to be apprised of what's going on if the agency of agriculture is the one conducting those yeah, if there's an ongoing investigation as part of the inspection. No, that would all be handled under an MOU. Um, and we're in the same position right now with other agencies and departments operating under memorandums of understanding with uh, A&R for water quality enforcement. Thanks, Lindsay. All right, Dave, back to you. Sure, just to fill in a couple of items there, uh, uh, Carrie did a great job explaining uh, about the uh, different inspectors that we do have, uh, the field agents. Uh, just keep in mind that all the field agents uh, currently, uh, as Carrie said, do do nursery inspections, feed seed fertilizer, lime, uh, ginseng, seed potato. Uh, it's quite a robust amount of expertise that these uh, field agents have. Um, and so that does really help out a lot when going to uh, sites and, uh, you know, looking at something in a, a totality uh, a sort of way, looking at a very holistic approach of uh, is something wrong with uh, this operation? And if it is, it might be touching upon multiple other items that the Agency of Agriculture has jurisdiction over. Uh, so it could be a fertilizer problem that leads you to a cannabis issue, or it could be uh, a registration issue that leads you to a nursery uh, issue, but everything is is correlated that way. Um, as far as training for uh, our inspectors, they do go through a, a couple of different programs uh, uh, externally as well as internal training. Uh, externally, uh, there's the CLEAR program. Uh, it's a uh, training organization uh, that takes uh, state regulators and put them through uh, a couple of different scenarios uh, and then teaches them or refreshes them on uh, report writing and other components. Uh, it is geared towards uh, a health inspector uh, as well as a uh, uh, oversight board of professional responsibility uh, type of inspection, but uh, it definitely is uh, my opinion as well as the agencies that if you can train somebody to write a report for one subject matter uh, and they have the basics, you can transfer that to any other type of uh, state agency administrative report. 
Uh, focusing specifically on environmental enforcement, uh, we do work very closely with the Northeast Environmental Enforcement Project. Uh, this is a group of uh, EPA professionals uh, as well as state regulators uh, who provide training uh, for state agencies and their regulators from Maine down to uh, West Virginia and all the way out to Ohio. Um, these trainings encompass uh, many different things such as uh, introduction to environmental enforcement all the way out to report writing, uh, how to handle uh, hazardous materials, uh, and how to incorporate those amongst other agencies and uh, better communication, conflict training, how to deal with hard situations and the like. Uh, that is specifically geared towards environmental enforcement and uh, are items that all of our uh, agents for water quality division, as well as for the public health agricultural resource management division, which I'm assuming the cannabis would fall under, uh, those agents would have to uh, uh, take basic as well as advanced training from these organizations. Internal. In our, I was gonna add, Dave, our hemp uh, inspector also has had uh, produce safety training from USDA. Carrie and Dave, thank you. And, and Tom, just for your note, it's 250. Doesn't look like I, I pulled the um, public participants in the room. Oh, Mark, I didn't see you back there. Would, oh, you, yeah. would you like to make a public comment or not? I'm not. I'm okay. I just I barely walked in the door. I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. All right. I, I think I know you. I think I have a pretty good idea, but you know, <laughs> I would, if I was going to say anything, I'd say, um, at 250. That's, yeah. We're trying in sustainability. Like people committee. have always been concerned about Act 250. We'll, we'll talk more about it later. All right. Thank you, Mark. I just wanted to say it doesn't look like we have any any um, public comments in the room mm -hmm. other than Mark's quick comment. Um, so <laughs> we have the next nine minutes to, to continue this conversation. Dave, feel free. Thanks, Kyle. I just wanted to add uh, one more thing. Our field agents also uh, do communicate with uh, state police as well as local police departments uh, throughout the towns and county sheriffs. Um, you know, uh, the agents certainly have a comfort level speaking to law enforcement, uh, speaking to uh, environmental enforcement officers over at uh, Department of Environmental Conservation housed under Agency of Natural Resources, um, as well as uh, working with Department of Motor Vehicles, um, uh, Enforcement, Traffic Enforcement Division, um, and being welcomed to board other types of uh, highway going vehicles such as logging trucks and other types of trucks that will be carrying goods that fall under the jurisdiction of the Agency of Agriculture. Uh, so we already do have quite a working relationship with other law enforcement uh, entities uh, which has proven to be very successful and uh, I think rewarding for our staff. And I'll try and kick off as many of these as I can. The next question is how does they dispose of hop hemp? Um, that depends. We've, um, it can be remediated. Um, we have had folks plow it under. Vermont law does allow them to sell it to a dispensary. Um, Mostly, if somebody's had a hot field, though, a field test very hot, and by hot, I mean five or six percent, not just nearly 0.3, they've plowed it under. We did have a seed dealer in the state that was, uh, their variety was hotter than they expected, and those fields did get plowed under. Um, we did observe those plowed under, plow unders, um, or composts. Um, who currently enforces the illicit, illicit cannabis market. Uh, and Carrie, just to interrupt real quickly, uh, we do go back out, take photographic evidence uh, to verify destruction, uh, and those are saved and uh, handled pursuant to our uh, public records uh, retention requirements. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, totally, I'm trying to be as thorough but brief as possible here who currently enforces the illicit, illicit cannabis market. That is the Department of Public Safety, but we have had referrals from the Department of Public Safety and we have referred cases back. Um, in some instances, they'll call over and the, the complaint is against somebody who has a hemp uh, permit and will go out and inspect. 
if we get a complaint that somebody's growing hemp and they don't have a permit, we will inform the Department of Public Safety to do that inspection. And it's worked in, in both instances where we've had a hemp, hemp growers growing um, high THC cannabis and we have had unregistered folks that the Department of Public Safety has come across growing hemp. So we've seen any iterance of that that you can imagine and um, we've worked jointly in those cases. Your other questions other than registration um, the board could could license the agency of ad could license um, DPR does do some licensing it can be any iteration that the board chooses to dream up I would suggest the path of least resistance is the way to go in that um, it may even the software that the board goes with could handle the licensing piece. Um, your question about the Board of Pharmacy, I I don't have a comment or or the Department of Revenue. Thank you, Carrie. There. <laughs> well you just ran through your whole program in like five five to, to six minutes, Carrie and, and Dave, so I appreciate it. Yeah. I wanna I wanna give Tim, Ingrid and, and Ashley an opportunity to ask any questions or um, for any further information that they might feel like is necessary to talk about uh, before we we discuss a vote on whether or not the agency of AG and the Cannabis Control Board should look towards a, a, a memorandum of understanding as it relates to the consumer protection bit of our program helping us with outdoor cultivation and indoor cultivation and and becoming a part of the, the enforcement team so um, Ingrid I see your hand up just a clarifying question about somebody had mentioned earlier in this conversation 600 license holders with a half an acre or less could you just clarify that please yeah that, those are like that, those are very broad and carrie if i mess this up let me know from a hemp program perspective ingrid i believe that there's around approximately 600 uh, hemp growers licensed through the Agency of Agriculture and on average if you look at um, their cultivation area as part of their application they're cultivating a half acre or less of hemp that's just a proxy um, to help us so, think, think about resources Kyle, we're off a decimal point there it's five acres or less oh well okay yeah. That makes a little bit more yep. sense in my head. I swear it half, Stephanie said half an acre, but I could be wrong. Acre is personal grow. Okay. You can grow to a half an acre at, under a personal grow, a $25 license. So Ingrid, our licenses are tiered. Um, half acre or less is a personal grow, one to five, five to 10, and then greater than 50. We do have uh, seven growers that gr are growing more than 50 acres. Um, Got it. Thank you. Tim, anything else on your end? No. Um, sorry. Frankly, some of this stuff is definitely above my pay grade. So, <laughs> uh, outside my wheelhouse as well. So, yeah. Um, and, and we we totally understand and appreciate that. I guess you know, my, my overarching thought is, do you think you've, you've heard enough and have enough confidence in the agency of agriculture's team to, to, for the board to move in a direction or to, to suggest that the board move in a direction that we uh, come to some type of agreement with them? I guess that's kind of the overarching thought I have here. I have a question. Yeah, I, I certainly would, um, if that's, looks like the consensus of the group, I wouldn't stand in the way because it, it feels like uh, it's a sensible way to go at this point to me. Sure. Before, Lindsay, Ashley, I haven't heard from you much this meeting. Just, just any thoughts or testimonials as, as a, um, a registrant or a license holder with the Agency of Agriculture? I think the way that we've been running the hemp program um, most recently with registering lots um, has been actually on the easier side for us for tracking. Um, we 
um, my company did just update our labels for state of Vermont's label requirements, which I know um, Stephanie and Carrie, I, I was highly advised by you guys with when going through that, um, with not only putting our processing license on or processors license number on our label, as well as linking that to the lots and then linking that to our lab result lab results which we which we don't have to but we publicly post on our website every time we put out a new batch um, and that then lists publicly 47 different contaminants and pesticides heavy metals that we test for and so it's a little premature for this conversation but I think I can lend a lot more expertise when it comes to that side of what to be looking for not only just in the THC levels or CBD levels but also what to be testing for um, on the pesticides or besides the heavy metal side of things but so far it's been very easy to register report and work with the agency um, and the hemp program as it sits now with the state of Vermont so yes I know we need to digitize this and I definitely think it's important to move towards some sort of larger you know website web host to preserve all this information so it's easy to access but um, as it sits now I feel that the at least on the hemp side the larger producers and brands we're all doing our due diligence and posting our labs publicly and helping consumers make that safe choice which we don't have to do maybe the agency is looking upon that now um, and seeing that and therefore we've avoided a lot of inspections and enforcement ourselves but um, yeah that's all not any questions mostly comment <laughs> thanks Ashley I appreciate it and, and maybe we can turn back to some of your comments when we get back into the seed to sale stuff on Thursday but but yeah so I'm Lindsay it's 301. I want to be respectful of everybody's time, but I want to, to capitalize on the consensus. It looks like we're building to a vote. Do you want to ask your question quickly? Um, I just related to they are going to give you a proposal where they also going to include, um, were they considering going out for initial inspections or not prior yeah. to maybe there being anything in their bailiwick? Carrie, do you want to comment on that? Quickly, do you typically go out and, and do a site visit before anybody puts plants in the ground? For the hemp producers, no. No. Okay. Well, I think. Um, I, I will add one thing, though, as far as soil testing is concerned, it really is up to the quality of the producer and the grower to test their soil prior because it saves us all a lot of um, headache and heartache and money in the long run if then you test your cola and then that flower is full of contaminants. So. Um, soil testing it isn't recommended necessarily by the state, but highly encouraged. Great, and that's so we, Go ahead, Gary. In order to sort of finish up on, I said for hemp producers, no, but for processors, yes. Um, we've worked with processing f facilities, done prior inspections before they've taken any product, and also worked with fire safety. Um, and help folks get through the process with fire safety um, when they're developing a processing facility. Gotcha. So we are before that happens. Great. Well, I think this is all stuff that if this subcommittee thinks that the board should work with the Agency of Agriculture, we can figure out in due time. But if everybody feels comfortable right now, what I would pose is putting up for a vote that this that the Cannabis Control Board look to work out a memorandum of understanding with the Agency of Agriculture for outdoor and indoor cultivation inspection compliance into forming uh, part of the enforcement team that, that, we'll, that we'll be having, you know, here through what we have in-house and, and agency partners. So if everybody feels comfortable voting, I, I'd say um, all in favor. Carrie, you might want to abstain since it's your program. Yes, I will. <laughs> Tom? Aye. Tim? Aye. Ingrid? Aye. Ashley? Aye. All right. All opposed? All right. The ayes have it. And we just chalked our first win, feather in a cap, for this committee, so let's take it as <laughs> something that we accomplished today, and we'll be back at it on Thursday. Okay. All right. We want to move Thanks, to adjourn, Tom? All right. Congratulations. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Lindsay?